The end of chapter 10 tells us to trust God alone. But what are we to trust him for? We've had glimpses of the answer to that question in chapter 2 and and 4, a little bit in chapter 6, a fair bit in chapter 9. But in chapter 11 we get the clearest vision of Isaiah so far. Not so much a return to Eden as an Eden-like city that fills the whole earth. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin by looking at the king of this new Eden. Verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. Jesse, of course, was King David's father. So this is a promise of a great king in David's line, his greater son. Not Ahaz and his fruitless vineyard, but a fruitful king. How is this king to be different to all the ones who've come before? Verse 2, the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. And what is it the spirit will give to this king? Wisdom and understanding. That is insight into a given situation and wisdom to know what to do to bring about the best results. Counsel and might, both of which take us back to those names in chapter 9 verse 6 of uh, this Emmanuel who is wonderful counsellor, mighty God. These are ideas about making plans, perhaps especially military plans, and then the power to carry them out. The Lord is the one you are to fear, 8 verse 13, the one who holds the line on the leash, do you remember? We've seen that again this morning, haven't we? All other gods, all other leaders, fruitless and pointless to trust them. This king knows who is really God, knows him fully and intimately, and delights in the fear of the Lord. Well, that's a change, isn't it? We, we forget what God is like, don't we? We forget how big and scary and good he is. That's why we so easily shift our focus to trust in other people or institutions or just trust in ourselves rather than the God who made the universe. But this king doesn't do that. He knows who God is and is wise enough to be governed by the fear of the Lord. Indeed, he is Emmanuel, God with us. He knows God perfectly. He walks before the Lord perfectly. And therefore, he is the ideal person to rule in this new Eden-like city. He's able to bring about a perfected human civilization. Parents, teachers, bosses, pastors, every one of us who ever has to make a decision or a judgment about a particular situation will do so with imperfect information. We have to judge by what our eyes see and what our ears hear. We can be deceived. We're fallible. Uh, Sometimes our eyes are even blinded by our own sinfulness. But not so with this king. He has a divine insight, perfect understanding and wisdom. Unlike the rulers of Isaiah's day who were prone to a bribe and who perverted justice so that widows and orphans suffered, Verse 5, righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. He's not corruptible, deceivable or prone to error. And he uses his perfect wisdom and his infinite power. Verse 4, with righteousness he will judge the needy, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. These are the very people who were most neglected in Jerusalem at the time of Isaiah and they will find justice in this king. And isn't that what we see in Jesus' life and ministry? A real care for the poor, the weak, the outsider. And a challenge for those who, in their corruption, abuse their power. Well, this is the nature of uh, the kingdom of King Jesus. So much in our society is crying out for justice, true justice. It's going to be found here, under the rule of Jesus. By the power of the word from his mouth, all wrongs will be righted, all suffering brought to an end, and the revolution doesn't stop simply at social issues. See, our passage envisages a return to the early chapters of Genesis, a pre-fall garden of uncorrupted joy and beauty. Think about the fall for a moment. That point where Adam and Eve believed lies about God, and in that spiritual corruption they turned their backs on God's ways. But now we have a king who is full of the knowledge of God. 
And so, verse 9, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We're prone, aren't we, to forgetting what God is like. And so in our sinfulness, we cling to false hopes, exactly like Adam and Eve did. But Jesus will solve that problem. The day is coming, you see, when every person, every animal, bird, fish will know God the way Jesus knows him, filled with the knowledge of God. That leaves no room, does it, for lies or untruths or half-perceived uh, realities when it comes to God. We shall see God as he truly is. And in that moment we'll be returned to that Eden-like perfection. The work that God is doing at the end of chapter 10, uh, weaning God's people off uh, lies about him and, and, and believing in false gods, is going to be completed when Jesus sits on his throne on the day of judgment and so we will be brought to that glorious perfection of knowing God truly and fully and, and that perfection in our relationship with each other justice and righteousness running through every human relationship will overflow beyond human society verses six to nine give us this beautiful picture of Eden restored doesn't it that the child who is able to lead animals and to look after them the way that Adam was supposed to lead. The lamb inviting the wolf for a sleepover. Animals who used to hunt and tear and kill now joyfully united with those who used to be their prey. And the small child having no need to fear at the snake because there's no danger anymore. No hurting or destroying or killing anymore on God's holy mountain. Everything in all creation is, is put into this perfect balance. Not competing for money or, or land or life. The abundance of God's goodness is sufficient for everyone to have enough, more than enough, without price, without cost. All the glorious order of the first creation is restored to its pristine perfection. And our hearts, they do long for Eden, don't they? They long for a deathless, painless reality. And an Eden-like city is exactly what God has planned when Jesus is seen to be on the throne. Even now, God is redeeming a people to belong to him, teaching us about himself, disciplining us when we need it, so that we are filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Not that we can get there fully now, not until we see Jesus face to face, in his resurrected glory but we can grow can't we we can persevere in learning about God, reading our bibles uh, reading other books uh, talking together encouraging each other asking questions going deeper because it's hard now because our sinful hearts want to turn away from god they want to trust in ourselves and other things which is why god continues to need to discipline us we are not in eden yet and we won't be till jesus returns but it is a promise, it is a hope for us. Of course, this raises the question for us, uh, when? When will this happen? And, and who will it be for, particularly? Who is it for? We'll come to that in a moment, but first, we're going to sing again, Glorious Things of You Are Spoken, Zion, City of Our God.